Gotti. Hello, I am so excited to be back at OffensiveCon for the third time. You know, first I had spoken to you before about hacking embedded devices, then I talked to you all about an Android bug allegedly used by NSO. And this year I get to come and chat to you about the many, many zero days we saw in the wild in 2021. Um, so first off, if you don't know me, my name is Maddie Stone. I am a researcher on Project Zero, where I focus on zero days in the wild. So learning from them, seeing how do we use that information for making zero day hard, Project Zero's mission. So let's get into it. So as I said, Project Zero mission, make zero day hard, it kills me that it's without the hyphen, but I gotta respect the mission, I guess. And so that's where all of this work that, for, that I'm doing comes from, of making sure that any you know, Project Zero's research and vulnerability research is founded in what is actually happening. It's not so much what, are we act or what do we think is happening, but what are attackers using? What do those zero days look like? And so that's where all of this work sort of comes from in the lens that I have on it. So I say a lot in the wild, zero days, zero days exploit in the wild, actively exploited, things like that. But unfortunately, I don't actually know all of the zero days that are actively exploited in the wild. You know, it turns out folks don't just say like, hey, planning to use this tomorrow, just wanna give it to you to give a heads up. Um, so instead, while this is the language you, we use, to be more technically correct, it's actually the zero day exploits that were detected and publicly disclosed as in the wild. And that it, distinction I think is important because it means that all of the conclusions, all of the data we have, we have to remember that there is going to be those biases, those gaps. And in, even more so because we don't have all of the ground, um, ground truth data it means that we don't always know what exactly those biases may be and those conclusions are. So that's all of my you know, sort of caveats and we'll get into more caveats later, but just wanted the, that distinction there. So let's get into the fun stuff. There were 57 zero days last year detected and disclosed as in the wild, which means I got to keep my job because there was a lot to analyze. Um, and so through this talk, I was gonna chat with y'all about what I think I've learned from it, what I saw as trends looking back over many years, et cetera, et cetera. But again, this was my conclusions looking at the data. And I think other people would have them. So in case you wanna go back and verify, you wanna see what we're working off of, we do keep a public spreadsheet where we track all of these in the wild zero days. Um, so feel free to check it out. It goes back to mid 2014. So as I said, a caveat, these are my takes and thoughts, and I'd love to hear yours. Um, when I was trying to come up with this talk, it's the third year that I'm trying to do a year in review, and it was actually a lot of data. <laughs> I was looking at it and I was like, nothing is standing out as it had for the year in review in 2019 and the year in the review of 2020. Nothing seems all that exciting. Nothing seems, wow, we've never seen this before. And finally, I realized that might be a conclusion in and of itself, despite having all of these data points. So I know usually you wait till the end of the talk to give your conclusion after you've presented all these data, presented all your examples, but I'm actually gonna start by telling you what I think my conclusions are based on analyzing all these zero days. So then you can see going into all of the examples we're gonna talk about, see, okay, do I agree? Do I disagree? with what these conclusions are. And then I would love for it to hear from y'all after the con, see what you think um, from there. So let's get started. The first one is, as you will see, 57 zero days is an astronomical amount compared to previous years. And so there were a lot of headlines this year of everyone is being hacked way more. Security's the worst, never use any products. There's, don't use iPhone, don't use Android, you know, basically go offline. I don't think this uptick actually is an indicator that security is getting worse, people are more vulnerable, et cetera. To me, this uptick actually represents positive indicators of security. So that's my first point. The second point, which I actually accidentally gave you all sneak peek to a few slides ago is, 
And we have so many more data points of what is actually happening in the wild. And from those data points, what we actually found is it's nothing too special. It was things that we've seen before. It was bug patterns that we've seen over the last couple of years, components targeted, matched what you know, public research was matching, exploit um, methodologies weren't really all that new. Um, there is one exception to this, which we'll get to, but in general, 56 out of 57 seemed pretty meh. And lastly, we have way more data than ever before to look at this stuff. And from that, what I found is even more confidence that we're missing more than I thought we were. Every year, I seem to think we are actually catching a smaller and smaller percentage of zero days that are actually in use. Um, and I do think there are real tactical, not tactical, but practical things that can be done to address some of these gaps. So first, why do I think the fact that there's a way more in the wild zero days is actually progress? Well, this graph probably doesn't help my point all that much. So as I said before, Project Zero has been tracking these since mid-2014 when the team was founded. Um, so I decided to start the graph at the first full year, which was 2015. 2015 was previously the max number that we'd ever seen before at 26. Uh, no, 28, sorry. <laughs> um, and this year, we hit 57, more than double the previous max. And this graph looks even scarier and somewhat more stark when you look at it compared to 2020. 2020 was only at 25, and yet something happened January 2021 that suddenly causes for the next 12 months to have this much more. So actually, in my 2019 year in review of zero days used in the wild, my whole thesis, I guess, was um, we have a detection deficit when it comes to these. I said that as a community, our ability to detect zero days being used in the wild is severely lacking to the point that we can't um, draw significant conclusions due to the lack and biases in the data we have collected. So I think we've made a lot of progress since then, the fact that that's gone up. Um, and I think there's actual real causes that we can attribute to that jump more than everyone is using zero days more. I think there's much more um, quantifiable reasons, explanatory reasons of what changed December 2020 to January 2021. So the big two pieces of it, I think, are there's more detection and more disclosure. Because remember, as I said at the beginning, what we're measuring is not actually the number of exploits used in the wild. It's the number of exploits detected and disclosed as in the wild. And so, to me, it makes a lot more sense. If we have reason to believe that there's been more detection, there's been more disclosure, why wouldn't that explain this jump? Um, so let's talk about the first one, more detection. So this whole area of research kind of makes me uncomfortable. I like quantifiable data. I like exact answers. I don't really like feelings. <laughs> but unfortunately, we got to deal with a lot of feelings and anecdotes here. And anecdotally, I have heard a lot of stories of folks getting more into putting resources into zero day detection. And thankfully, there's at least one metric that may help explain this. And so these are the number of different reporters for in the wild zero days over the last few years. So these. I removed any that had been reported anonymously, but if they had an in the wild annotation or comment and that person was listed as credited for the CVE, I put them here. And what we see is there is double the number of folks um, listed as previous years. So maybe, you know, it's all a coincidence, but I do think it shows that there's a lot more folks looking at this maybe. Or if it's the same number of folks, there's a lot more folks disclosing, owning it, talking about the fact that they found it. So to me, that helps show, yeah, that's probably why this number has gone up. The second side is more disclosure. So in November 2020, Apple began annotating their release notes with an in the wild annotation for the first time. Before um, November of 2020, they never put any of those notes that, hey, we've heard this may have been exploited in the wild or whatever. 
we relied on researchers to come forward and publish about it. Um, Android had never done that before January 2021. So we have these two large products and vendors finally for the first time coming out and saying, we're not gonna rely on researchers to come and tell folks in the public that there is in the wild exploitation. We will tell you if we've been um, informed that. And so if we look at the number of Apple, you know, WebKit, iOS, and Mac OS, and Android, uh, zero day in the wild over, you know, this period of time, it's jumped hugely, if that's a word, <laughs> in this year. And it's actually more interesting when we take a look at which of those bugs were reported anonymously and non-anonymously. Non and the reason why I think this matters in the context of annotations now on release notes is that if you do not want credit for the CVE on a security bulletin, I think it's pretty unlikely you're gonna publish a blog post and be like, hey, I have evidence, I have reason to believe, I've seen this, this was exploited in the wild. And so, if y'all stand with me on the assumption, that means that we would have known about 12 less zero days this year. And so kudos to Apple and Android, Google, Chrome, Microsoft, Firefox, Adobe, um, et cetera, have been doing this, so they get kudos for you know, doing it more years, many years before as well, but I think this is a great step from Android and Apple and contributes to the more disclosure. So my next claim is, nothing's all that new. It's kind of meh. And so the first thing is, is like, yeah, it's still all memory corruption. Well, not all, but mostly. And that is how just about all of these bugs work. There were 39 of the 57 um, zero days were memory corruption bugs, um, which accounted for 68%, um, which is still, you know, the vast majority of all of these bugs. And then when you break it down even further, they're really falling into these bug patterns all of us know about, have seen over and over again. You know, use after free is still, for like the past four years, it's been the number one um, most common vulnerability of zero days in the wild, and then out of bounds reads or writes, buffer overflows, and urge overflows. So these are all bug patterns that we've seen a dime a dozen times. And that's what is making up so many of these in the wild zero days. So next, I'm going to support my claim that everything is sort of meh. We're going to go through each of the different browsers, or not browsers, each of the different sort of platforms, the main ones, obviously. Well, much to my chagrin, I'm not allowed to come and just talk to you about every single bug that we've seen this year. I guess y'all would not want to sit here for eight hours and listen to that. Um, so we're going to go through each of sort of the big platforms, talk about some of the examples, talk about why um, there really wasn't much that's new. So first, in terms of browsers, we saw 14 for Chromium, seven for WebKit, Safari, and four for Internet Explorer. Um, and for those, if we break down the components of the browser they're targeting, we still see that the vast majority is JavaScript engines, which makes sense, you know, especially listening to, um, <laughs> listening to you know, Samuel and Amy's talks Yesterday, there is still a lot of exploitation you can do. It's generally, there are a lot of bug patterns we can still follow. And then with the second most common component being targeted being the DOM engine. And so this basically matches the last um, three years as well. For all of the last three years, JavaScript engine has been the around 45 to 50% um, of the browser bugs, and DOM engine has been around 14 to 17%. So it's staying pretty stable. Maybe not all of y'all's goal is to make zero day hard, but it is my goal. And so one of the ways that I will feel like, yeah, we've made a big step, it is harder, is when these graphs of components being targeted, how attackers are able to have success with zero days when that changes. So Chrome, um, it's just sort of, yeah, it followed a lot of the common um, targets that we've seen, pretty across the board the same. Um, yeah. WebKit was similar, four JavaScript core, one IndexedDB, one storage, and one universal cross-site scripting. Uh, but I'm gonna sort of make a tangent and bring all in on a story time here. 
Um, so this is a use after free in WebKit. It was patched in September um, of last year. And so this is the description. You know, it says, uh, may have been actively exploited and use after free. So not a lot of information in there. And I was like, I haven't really ever done browser stuff. I've definitely never done WebKit. I want a root cause analysis and variant analysis. Seems like a great bug to just get started and get into that. So unfortunately, despite being open source, WebKit does not tie CVEs or the security bulletins to the patch. Um, and so, I thought, okay, to figure out what patch it may be, I need to go through between the two releases and I'll see what bugs have changed, which ones look security, and things like that. And after combing through, I found this bug. Definitely security, there weren't really many other options there. Talked to the teammates, we all felt pretty confident this was the bug, and so I got to work. And you know, actually, I was pretty proud of myself. I got that done pretty quickly. And wrote up the RCA, waited till 30 days patch to publish it because that's um, our Project Zero policy from this last year. And um, everything was bliss, right? Seven days later, that appears in my inbox. Greetings from Apple product security. I really tried not to open it, but <laughs> unfortunately that didn't seem like a long-term plan. So I did, and very kindly, um, Apple product security let me know that I had in fact um, root caused the wrong bug and published the POC for a bug that was not actually fixed yet. Um, yeah, not my, not my favorite day, I gotta say that. <laughs> but I do appreciate Apple, one, letting me know, and two, how kindly <laughs> they handled that. Um, and so especially, even more kindly, they sent me the correct patch, uh, the one that actually was the bug I was trying to root cause. So hey, I just got double the WebKit experience. I thought I was done, um, I checked the box, but no. And scarily enough, it was an index DB which I very quickly learned was not probably the component I would jump in for first time browser, but here we were. I felt, I published the first wrong one, you know, updated our public GitHub of RCAs to say whoopsie daisy on it, and so I needed to get a correct one out there. So there were two different files changed in this patch. One was IDB request, um, and the other was this um, file called crossthreadtask.h, which is used in IndexedDB, as you would imagine, to, for cross-thread tasks to occur. If, you know, one thread needs to say, hey, I need you to do this database thing for me. And this was, I didn't really know what to make of this. As someone who has little C++, even littler browser, and even less WebKit experience, I was like, huh? What, is, what am I doing with that? Um, but what it turns out that was fixing is that the object that was being freed in this use after free, and the object that was the call lead to that create cross thread task is this thing called an IDB open DB request, which extends IDB request. And notably IDB request then extends this thread safe ref counted IDB request class. And so if we look back at the patch, there at the top, basically there are two different types um, of function for create cross-thread task. One, um, the top one is enabled as a template if whatever callee's type is, um, thread safe ref counted callee type is a base of it. Um, and that uses the make ref pointer um, for the callee. But the bottom one that's saying if the callee's type is not a child of thread safe ref counted angle bracket um, uh, callee type, then that one's gonna use a raw pointer. And despite what it looked like um, IDB open to be request should use the top, it actually used the bottom one which had the raw pointer leading to the use after free. And the reason why is that IDB open DB request actually extends thread safe ref counted IDB request not IDB open DB request. And so that's why it ended up going into um, the, whatchamacallit, the raw pointer option. And so I have a heart next to this because it's a tweetable POC 
and Yvonne and I this year got very excited each time one of the In the Wild Zero Days had a POC that was less than 280 characters and we could tweet. So if you see hearts, <laughs> that, is, that is why. <laughs> Tweetable POC. Um, and so this is how you trigger it. When I was asking my teammates preparing for this presentation, what was your favorite bug of the year? Um, there was a clear favorite in general, but this one also got a um, head nod because um, in Sergey's words, if I, let's see if I get his words correctly, it's dealing with the, uh, oh, I wrote it, a bug in template metaprogramming so it's at least somewhat modern. So there we go. <laughs> but still, they use after free. So there's my story time. Next, Internet Explorer. And maybe you're wondering why am I giving potentially more slides to Internet Explorer than Chromium? And because I think this graph is super interesting. Since 2015, over the last seven years, the number of Internet Explorer's ear days really, really isn't changing all that much despite the changes in market share. And it turns out, though, that we can sort of see why in the data. If we look at the different components targeted over the last few years, this year, 75% of them suddenly were in MSHTML, which is the Internet Explorer tri Trident browser engine. And, oops, jumping ahead. Um, <laughs> and what's interesting is all three of those were not actually delivered via the browser to users. So they came through other files, which could automatically access Internet Explorer on Windows machines since MSHTML is there. And thus, it's not targeting folks using Internet Explorer as their browser different than um, our other browser exploits in platforms. And so let's talk about one of these examples, CVE 2021-33742. It's an out-of-bounds write in MSHTML. And so basically the context, um, Google Tag wrote a long blog post on this, um, which I'll have linked in the slides. Um, but basically malicious office stocks were delivered to the targets, and um, the office stocks loaded web content in Internet Explorer. It's spawned the IE process via VBA macros. Um, and once you know it was fingerprinted, dis decided to deliver the exploit, it was a pretty conventional bug. It's an out of bounds write in MSHTML. So basically, the length of the inner HTML element is stored in two different places. In one place, that length was truncated, and the other it was not. The truncated length was used for the allocation. The mem copy used the non-truncated length. So, you know, generally this bug pattern that you sort of see in intro to security classes in CS nowadays, too. Um, but we got a tweetable puck out of it, so yay. <laughs> um, so, it's, we've been talking about a lot, but maybe these IE bugs will finally be done. I will not have to root cause another Internet Explorer. But unfortunately, it looks like that might not be the case. Um, Microsoft has announced that they will be deprecating IE in 2022 in June. So that you'd think that'd be, yay! But unfortunately, the announcement also said that the retirement does not affect MSHTML Trident Engine, and, and thus that will continue being accessible on Windows 10 builds. And so based on that, I think it's probably likely we will continue to see these MSHTML bugs as a attack vector to get onto machines. Um, as a side note, which when we're thinking about enterprise sort of targeting as well, um, and enterprises will be allowed it says in here to pay for support through 2029. So Internet Explorer, might, we might still be talking about it in 2028. <laughs> Windows, so lots of exploits um, tend to be exact. Um, and while none of this made us super, super excited, I do think this deserves a call out because this is one of the places I think we can look and be like, okay, maybe zero day on Windows is getting a little bit harder because we only had two of the 10 as Win32K this year. And in 2019, there were 75% of Windows zero days um, targeting Win32K. So, you know, with the one, Windows 7 being deprecated and two, the Windows 10 progressive lockdowns. Um, I think that might account for why we're seeing this, um, pro this movement towards different um, components being targeted. 
Next one, iOS and macOS. So we finally got our first macOS in the wild. You know, everyone's saying Mac, use Macs, they're never targeted. It's cool, we have the evidence now. So what did those look like? So I'm sort of grouping them together since um, they're similar components. Four iOS, one macOS, um, and of, of those five, two targeted IO mobile frame buffer, two targeted the XNU kernel, and one targeted core graphs. So first up, IO mobile frame buffer. It's really had its time to shine lately, but unfortunately, it's really not all that new. Um, so we've seen a lot of IO mobile frame buffer research um, publicly in the years leading up to this. So it's not shocking, it's not this new component of how to get into the iPhones. And when we also take a look at the two XNU bugs, oh yes, yeah, side note, one of the zero days for 2022 so far is also IO mobile frame buffer. So seems like it may continue. Um, but yeah, so for the two X and U's, the iOS one was using mock vouchers um, and the Mac OS one was using mock messages. So both of those are objects in um, X and U's IPC mechanisms. And we've actually seen um, in the wild targeting both of those components previously, despite the smaller number of sample size. Um, so we still, yeah, oops, wrong way. And, but as a pause, there was one bug that has led to the exception. So I need a drum roll, come on. No, you don't just, for the best bug of the year, my doggy. <laughs> my dog's name is Bug, and I did not name him. And Mark Dowd showed us a picture of his cat, so I had to fit him in there somewhere. Hi, Bug. <laughs> but for real, so forced entry, the zero-click iMessage bug, is really the one exploit that I think everyone just stopped and was like, whoa. This is impressive. So Ian Beer, at the end of last year, published um, very detailed blog posts into sort of the history of the components, the bug, um, and most notably the exploit. Because actually the bug really isn't um, the super interesting part. I just had to say bug so I could give you all a photo of my dog. Um, but it's the exploit where it really sets it apart. And so I'll link to Ian's blog post because I will not do it justice of all the detail he provides. But basically, it is an integer overflow um, in the core graphics um, API, and specifically the JBIG2 uh, image parser. And so the other thing that was notable about this, though, is you know for years, everyone's been saying, zero-click iMessage bugs, zero-click iMessage bugs, zero-click iMessage bugs. And we've known that they're apparently in use, but no one's found any examples of them. We had Natalie and Samuel, you know, at the last offensive con giving a security researcher talk on it, but still we didn't have examples. So we finally have that example here. And so what's happening is we have the 32-bit integer num sims, and we have this loop that is adding to it. If you construct um, the number of segments or correctly, you can cause num sims to overflow um, with the and that overflowed um, number is used in the malloc at number three, but when you're copying, it is not, it is doing each one, which can lead you to having that integer overflow. So the bug wasn't that cool, but the exploit was, and I'm not gonna even pretend to be able to explain it all to you in this talk. So just know, if you have not somehow not read this blog post yet, um, hopefully my other compression format is turning complete, uh, will help get you there, um, and so go check that out. So the last sort of vendor section we're gonna talk about is Android. We finally have some Android in the wild zero days to reference, to talk about, yes, it is being exploited. Yes, it is being targeted. So prior to this year, we only had one example of an Android in the wild, and that was what I talked to you all about here at OffensiveCon 2020. Um, and so this year, we actually had seven. So these seven zero days um, targeted Qualcomm Adreno GPU, our Mali GPU, and two targeted the upstream kernel. And so this was really great data to have. Over 2020 and 2021, we've been seeing more and more security researchers publish example um, Android chains, and all of them were t targeting the GPU drivers. 
And so this sort of shows like, yeah, it is a really good target and the gap between the real actually happening zero days and what security researchers were doing was pretty close. And the reason why these GPU drivers is of such interest makes a lot of sense. Android ecosystem is becoming so and so fragmented that if you want to maintain a capability for Android devices, then that can require lots and lots of exploits. But if you then take a step back and think about how, oh, there's really only two GPU providers for the whole Android ecosystem, suddenly you only really need two exploits, one for the Qualcomm Adreno and one for our Mali to be able to have so much more coverage across that Android ecosystem. Then with the two upstream kernel bugs. So the trend we saw here unfortunately continued um, compared to the one that we had seen in 2019 in that these two upstream kernel bugs were both previously known upstream prior to their exploitation in Android. And so the Android kernel had just not taken um, those patches. So here's an example. Basically the story goes is that there was a bug fix applied to the Android kernel a few weeks before this one. It actually um, introduced this bug. So this bug was quickly patched, I think about two weeks later um, in September. That first patch that was fixing the original one and introducing a bug, that was included in the Android December 2020 um, security bulletin. But the fix for the bug it introduced was not included in the security bulletin. So while the Linux upstream kernel was only vulnerable to this for about two to three weeks, it was not patched in Android until November 2021, giving about 11 months um, of vulnerability in Android. And so this sort of continues because the binder bug from 2019 also was known or fixed in the upstream kernel and had not um, made it to Android kernels. And this is similar to something we saw um, in that this bug did correctly label upstream, hey, we're actually free, um, fixing this previous commit and um, and, but they still did not take the second one. They only included the original commit. So that's sort of all of my reasoning at the vendor level of why I think this year was kind of meh. We didn't really see a lot of new things. The state of zero-day exploitation did not seem to really change all that much from what we can tell. Um, but my last conclusion is though, yeah, we have all this data, but I don't know how much value to place in it. It makes me feel like, oh, we're missing more and more and more as I studied more and more and more zero days. So I'm going to talk to you about some of the questions I have um, as I was looking all of this. So first, where are the messaging app exploits? We know they exist. Yes, it's harder to detect because they are generally more targeted than, say, the browser exploits. But that's a giant gap we have. So far in all of our record keeping, we now have two. We have the WhatsApp one from 2019, and we have the iMessage one from this year. But we know messaging apps are an interesting target, yet they're not um, seen in the wild. What about the other phone components? So now we've seen a GPU driver being targeted. We see kernels. But what about Wi-Fi chips? What about the baseband chips? Things like that. Yes, some of the, again, those are more difficult to likely detect, especially for physical proximity but we know there's interest in them. We know they're being developed, um, so where's the detection? Linux um, also is one, you know, we talk about Windows, Mac OS, et cetera, but we're not seeing the Linux ones. All of cloud, while I tended to focus on sort of user and devices in this presentation, because I had to choose something and cut somewhere, like that is a target of interest. So how do we begin to detect those exploits? Um, and lastly, where are the specific Android OEM? I had mentioned that the ecosystem for Android has become so fragmented, but that means that it, there should be, we should be seeing, I would think, Samsung zero days, Xiaomi zero days, Huawei Pixel, et cetera. Yet we are only seeing those zero days that, you know, ARM, Qualcomm, which are general, or the Linux kernel. And so that question then leads me to ask, is it detection, disclosure, or both? Are we 
not detecting, not putting in the resources, or haven't come up with a new research area of how do you detect these? Or are these being detected and folks aren't sharing? They have not you know, decided to start annotating their release notes or publishing about it or talking at all about that they've heard from whoever reported that things are in the wild. And I do think the answer is likely both. I also look at the reporters and wonder, why don't we see more vendor security teams listed here? Because if you think about it, when we, if we want to get better at detection, I do. I know maybe not everyone does, but I do. If we want to get better at detecting zero days, wouldn't the vendors be the best ones at it? Because they have the most telemetry, right? They actually have source code. Um, they, I would think, have some debuggers or testing infrastructure. But the ones highlighted here are the only entities that have been credited for um, in the wild CVEs for their own product. And that again, I ask, and I don't know the answer to, is it that vendors are not putting in all the resources and doing this work or not having success, or do they not disclose it when it is a internal find or give it a CVE or something like that? My second to last question is, do all of these bug patterns seem meh, seem not that interesting, seem like things we've seen before, because that's what we know how to detect, because we are actually really anchoring on the bugs we've seen before and what we know vulnerabilities to look like? Or is that actually representative of what is happening of the general population of um, zero days in EOS? My final question is, where are the sploits? So if you notice, most of my, just about all of my presentation today is focused on bugs when I've gotten into the example, the details of the vulnerability. But when doing this work in publishing, my goal is first, we need an understanding of what is the zero day being exploited and how is it being exploited. With both of those pieces being really important um, and to understanding from the offensive security researcher point of view or security researcher point of view. However, out of the 57 zero days in the wild, there were only five of those exploit samples publicly available. So there were some other instances still in the single digits where folks published a detailed explanation and description of the exploit method, like for example, Ian's blog post, but the sample wasn't being shared. But that's still such a small number of understanding of the exploit methods um, that's happening that we can't really take a look and, and make changes on, implement mitigations, understand, um, if things actually are changing and getting um, the exploits look much different. So that basically concludes most of what I was planning um, to cover. I have, um, I figured I would give you all my conclusions and emojis. So first, the big uptick of in the wild zero days. I think it's great. One, I have um, plenty of work to do. Two, I do think it is actually indicators of progress in this space, both general security and in this in the wild detection and disclosure. Because as I explained to you before, I do think most of this can be explained by detection and disclosure, but I also think it's important to remember that when zero days are being used, it's generally because less sophisticated technical means don't work. So if we see a drop in zero days and they're like, oh, there's no zero days, but hey, everyone can be pwned by end days, I don't think that's progress. So that's why I also sort of advocate that, especially for security teams, don't anchor on trying to reduce the number of in the wild zero days. Second, bug patterns and types are pretty similar to previous years. Um, yeah, it was just sort of fine. I'm glad we found them, but um, I'm also glad that it seems security, public security research and what's happening in the wild do seem to be um, closely related when you know new decisions are being based on, based on public research. Like, that's good that we are approximating and understand um, ideas. And lastly, I think there's still room for improvement on detection and closure. Um, I chose the monocle because like, sure, searching. And if you were not aware, I have been informed by Project Zero's manager, Tim Willis, this is not 
praying hands emojis, but they're actually high fives. So let's do some teamwork. <laughs> but through this whole thing, like, I don't know, what do you think? I, I can always have my mind changed. And I think looking at this and talking with folks, I do always notice that there's a lot of different interpretations of what we're seeing, what the data looks like, um, based on different sort of expertise and things like that. So come find me, come chat. But all of my team members and friends will tell you that I could talk about this stuff forever and ever and ever. Um, so yeah, that would make me happy if you want to chat. And lastly, if you want to get in involved, these are my hopes and dreams. Um, so I think these are areas of very practical progress that I would like to see start to change in the next year of one, that we are able to have a root cause analysis, patch analysis, and variant analysis performed on every in the wild zero day. I, w I wasn't even close for 20, um, 2021, but we do accept um, pull requests on the public um, GitHub repo where we host all of these, and so I love it. If you want to get involved, you know, happy to talk over bugs that might be a good fit if you want to just get started with this type of work. Um, yeah. Two, that exploit samples are shared more widely because that's an important piece of the puzzle. How are vulns actually being exploited versus just what is the vuln? And even if maybe asking for them publicly shared is a step too far right now, sharing them with folks or publishing details about how that exploitation method works. Because at least then there's the technical details available to evaluate. Lastly, it's been, I'm actually a little shocked of just how big a difference I think Android and Apple annotating their security bulletins this year made. And so seeing if we can get more vendors to transparently annotate that. Because even if I take a step back out of my security research role. As a user, I want to know if there is any knowledge that a vuln they're patching or issuing patches for on my device has been ex actively exploited. Each and every one of us have different threat models. And so by providing that information, I think is a very important piece of it. Um, and lastly, more and more and more detection. I think we've really just started to um, take first steps into what does detection reach search look like? I don't, I think it's going to have to get super creative um, with new risky, not risky, but like kind of out of the box thinking for us to have success in this. Um, and lastly, thank you. Um, I'm Maddie Stone. Yeah, and I think I did leave time for questions. Woo! <laughs> Are y'all really gonna just make me stand up here? Go to the mic. <laughs> All right. Oh. <laughs> Hi. Um, I'm wondering if you could tell us more about what you think vendors could do in coming years as opposed to what they've been doing in the past. Thanks, non, not my manager. <laughs> um, so I think, so the year in review from 2020 actually was that 25% of the zero days in the wild that year were variants of previously known vulns. And I, I think that while maybe there was progress there, I didn't feel comfortable giving a, a number on that this year because I would feel like I would need to have done um, detailed analysis of all 57 exploits to that level, and I didn't. Um, and so I think that is still an area. A lot of vendor security teams aren't doing the detailed root cause analysis. They're still trying to break um, pox or exploits. They're not looking to see if that bug pattern exists in other places. You know, that's part of the reason why we've had two in, 22, two in the wilds in 2022 so far. And both are kind of similar to bugs we, in the wilds we saw in 2021. The first one was in um, Windows, and the second one was in IO Mobile Frame Buffer. Um, second, more transparency. Like, I also think that 
It would be great if vendor security teams are the ones publishing these root cause analysis, patch analysis, variant analysis, and it's not follow it, falling on third-party teams, that this is just sort of a part of the responsibility of having um, people trust you and use your products and put all of their data and sort of livelihood on there and life. Um, so yeah, those are some of the, oh. Hi, uh, thank you very much for your talk, uh, really interesting. I wanted to ask, uh, one of the slides had a uh, point that um, the question is whether we uh, just know how to detect those things and that's why we're detecting or uh, maybe that's what uh, is out there. And uh, I think it, the answer to this depends a lot on uh, how it is that we are detecting those things. Mm -hmm. But uh, obviously there wasn't you know, a, a lot of information about this. And I think it's also an important part of the kind of community-based uh, uh, research about this is to uh, know and share the approaches that are used to detect those things. So I was wondering if Google or you've been you know, familiar with those approaches and uh, can share how um, and what the Google stance is about you know, the future of detecting those things. So y'all really wanted Shane to answer that question in Keynote, huh? <laughs> I'm second best up here. I mean, one, that, that is Google Tags information, so it is not mine to provide or share. Um, and yeah, I think that would be great from you know, a defender point of view for sharing information, all tides, you know, ra or raising the tide, I don't know what the boat tide thing quote was. Um, but at the same time, I do understand that, especially if you find one really good technique, when I put on my offensive hat, the first thing I think is, oh yeah, if I knew about that, that would be pretty easy to bypass. So I think that's where figuring out what that balance may be. Um, one thing that I have done is talk to vendors, just giving ideas if they talk about, hey, this is the problem I'm trying to solve. I don't know what to do, of just going, in, okay, cool. If you're welcome, we're happy to brainstorm ideas with you based on what information you're willing to share. So I think that um, might be approach for folks to begin taking as well. Thank you very much, makes sense. <laughs> Uh, so you mentioned um, you, uh, hypothesizing that okay, if we see more uh, O days in the or we see fewer O days in the wild, we're probably uh, seeing more in days. Uh, do you guys have an interest in also uh, you know tracking in days? Obviously, that's less sexy, but you know, like <laughs> I, I mean, I mean for the for the person using them, right? It's yeah. more attractive to use something that's a bit more disposable. Yeah. So one clarification. I do not think necessarily that it's definitely equal that if we see the number of zero days go down, that definitely means everyone's moved to phishing or malware or in days for success. Um, but I do think it is something to keep in mind that especially where we are now, I, don't, I feel like a sudden drop off in zero days would be indicators that you know, we're not doing great things in security, something we've, something we've done has made a negative change, whether that's less transparency, detection, whatever. Um, but I personally um, will not begin working on end days just because my whole role is to focus on zero days in the wild. So I do know there are lots of different folks that I follow, um, especially a lot of threat intel does focus on you know, how are people getting in in general, which does include a lot of those in days and other techniques. So I think I will leave it to them. Um, and so I definitely play also into Shane's slide of thinking zero days are everything. But no, <laughs> yeah, just because that's my role um, and it's more than enough work, I will probably stick to zero days. <laughs> um, why do you think there's a reluctance to sh uh, share the exploit samples publicly? So I think it can release a lot of information. So there were a lot of zero days um, reported anonymously this year. And don't want to get too much into that because I think, great, it's reporting. The data, you know, the fact that it was in the wild is being shared. That is a huge win. Um, but I think when you share exploit samples, there's a lot of caution and fear that maybe I haven't even realized what information this may give away about my techniques or who I am or what we're doing or things like that. Or is this, and so I think that sort of unknown of could this have extra indicators or something in it that says, 
oh yeah, this is my setup to get things, or this is how I detect, or stuff like that. You know, obviously I don't know. If anyone wants to come and talk about challenges and sharing information, happy to do that too. Um, one other point is I think this was the first year where folks started to get some positive press talking about um, zero day exploits. And vendors were not, which is something I hope we can sort of start changing because it, you know, if vendors keep getting hit in the press every time they've labeled something as in the wild, that's not quite the incentive I'm going for. Um, but I do think for reporters and researchers, there did tend to be more positive um, reinforcement, more positive press when it's like, oh yeah, we've discovered this thing and stopped this thing. So hopefully that trend will continue because I don't think it was like that previously. Cool. Alrighty. Well, thank y'all very much.